Thomas Aquinas once said, "There is nothing on earth more to be prized than true friendship." With this note, a very good morning to everyone present here. I welcome everyone to the first India-Japan summit under the initiative of India-Japan Business Forum. Politica and Consilium Research Institute is extremely elated that each one of you took out your valuable time to attend this meeting for addressing the relations between India and Japan. The first segment of this meeting would be about India-Japan at 70, strengthening partnership, deepening cooperation, and expanding collaboration. The onus of this discussion would be to get a broader outlook towards India-Japan bilateral relations, the cooperation of both the countries in the area of commerce, trade, and investment, areas where both the countries can cooperate post-COVID, and the aspects of Indo-Japanese relationship in the area of academia and cultural cooperation. Today we have with us Ambassador Sri Vinod Kumar, former ambassador to Uzbekistan and additional secretary, uh, Secretary of Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, and Major General Dr. Rajan Kocha, BSM, former MGAOC Central Command, Indian Army, and the Vice Chairman of NCNB, as the conveners of the meeting. Uh, without further ado, I would now like to ask. Uh, I would now like to introduce Ambassador Sri Vinod Kumar sir before asking him to give his remarks about today's event. Introducing him, yeah. Ambassador Kumar was High Commissioner of India to Fiji, with concurrent accreditation to the Cook Islands, Kiribati, Nauru, Tonga, and Tuvalu from 2010 to 2014. He also dealt with the Pacific Islands Forum and the other Pacific re regional organizations in Suva. He was the additional secretary international organizations from 1st September 2014 to 13 May 2015. Prior to his retirement, he served as India's ambassador to Uzbekistan. I would now like to call sir to give his remarks on today's event. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to this event in a virtual format dedicated to the India Japan summit and themed on India at 70 unleashing potential, releasing aspirations, rebuilding together. Chairman uh, PCRI has set the tone for the event. India and Japan have a close and multifaceted relationship that has expanded and strengthened over the seven decades since the establishment of our diplomatic relations. Our relationship is based on the strong foundation of our historical civilizational ties. In recent years, India and Japan have added the dimension of strategic and security cooperation to the strong political and economic ties. Japan's assistance has been of great help in our socio-economic development. The leadership of both the countries is committed to work for the realization of the full potential of our partnership for the mutual benefit of our peoples. The India-Japan Business Forum is indeed privileged to be hosting this their first event on Japan with the participation of eminent persons and experts. And we look forward to their views on the state and prospects of India-Japan relationship. India-Japan Business Forum and PCRI are thankful to the distinguished panelists for their for sparing their time and sharing their experience and views with us. The first session would look at strengthening partnership, defining cooperation and expanding collaboration. We are privileged to have serving and former ambassadors to Japan to join us today. I would like to take this opportunity to also welcome Ambassador Preet Malik uh, to this thing. And also I, uh, I and my co-convener, Ms. General Kocher, convey their best wishes to all to the audience as well, and hope that they will have a very uh, useful interactive session with our distinguished panelists. We are privileged to have Ambassador Sujan Chenoy, who has been Ambassador to Japan and has held many distinguished positions and is currently heading the IDSA. And also 
His Excellency Mr. Sanjay Kumar Verma, who is currently the Ambassador of India to Japan. We will have also video messages from Honorable Chief Minister of Meghalaya and Honorable Chief Minister of Mizoram. So I think that would set the tone for our one day conference and in future with the support of all of you, we would perhaps have more interactive events and that would in its own small way contribute to further expanding and strengthening our relationship with our friendly country, Japan. Thank you. Thank you so Indeed, much, sir. It was very uh, detailed insight to the event. So moving ahead, we can start with uh, uh, Shubham. You can now play the video message of the Chief Minister of Mizoram. And Chief Minister, uh, Chief Minister Meghalaya, Chief Minister Mizoram will be joining us anywhere between 11.25 to 11.30. So you can start with Chief Minister Meghalaya's video message. I would like to take a moment, sir. Um, Like the cherry blossom trees brought from Japan in 1955, Meghalaya and Japan's relationship has blossomed over the years. The visit to Meghalaya of Japanese ambassador to India, Sri Satoshi Suzuki, during Cherry Blossom Festival, marking the celebration of the Golden Jubilee of statehood of Meghalaya, have deepened cultural ties. Over the course of last several years, Meghalaya and Japan have deepened the collaboration in the areas of tourism and skill development. The recent funding of rupees 700 crores from Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA, to Meghalaya government for the promotion and development of the tourism sector in the state reflects the testimony of Japan, Meghalaya, and India-Japan ties. The year 2022 is a special year for both India and Japan, as both the countries are commemorating 70 years of establishment of their diplomatic ties. In the course of last seven decades, Indo-Japan ties have deepened in every sphere under the special strategic and global partnership. The recent visit of India by Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida for the annual summit reaffirmed the closeness between India and Japan and even laid out a roadmap for deepening the special strategic and global partnership between the two countries in a post-COVID world. Therefore, to further consolidate and unleash the immense potential of India-Japan ties, India-Japan Business Forum under Politica and Consilium Research Institute is presenting the India-Japan Summit themed on India-Japan at 70, unleashing potential, realizing aspirations, rebuilding together. Under the convenorship of Sri Vinod Kumar, IFS, former ambassador of India to Uzbekistan and high commissioner of India to Fiji, Cook Islands, Kiribati, Nauru, Tonga, and Tuvalu, and Major General Dr. Rajan Kocher, VSM, former MGAOC, Indian Army. I convey my best wishes for the overall success of the summit. Arigoto, Gozemas, Kublai, Matela, and Jehin. Ambassador Kumar, can you please uh, mute yourself, sir? Yeah. So, 
Chief Minister Mizoram will be joining us by 11.30, Shubham, so we can directly move with the Excellency, Ambassador Sanjay Kumar Goma. So before that, uh, please give a brief introduction about Excellency. Sure thing, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I would like. I would. I would now like to invite His Excellency uh, Shri Sanjay Kumar Verma, Ambassador to Ambassador of India to Japan, to share his thoughts upon the issue. Introducing him, Ambassador Sanjay Kumar Verma is an officer of 1988 batch of Indian uh, Indian Foreign Service. He was stationed at the Consulate General of India, Hong Kong, and at the Embassy of India in China, Vietnam, and Turkey. Before serving as the Consul General of India in Milan, it, Italy. Ambassador Verma was also the Indian ambassador to the Republic of Sudan. Following his tenure in Sudan, Ambassador Verma served as the Joint Secretary Global Estate Management in MEA New Delhi. Prior to his arrival in Japan as the ambassador of India, Ambassador Verma was posted in MEA New Delhi as additional secretary administration and was also in charge of Cyber Diplomacy Division. I would now like to ask His Excellency Sri Sanjay Kumar Verma, Ambassador of in India to Japan, to address the delegation. Sir, please. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. Good morning to all of you. Uh, Chair Ambassador Vinod Kumar, former ambassadors, dignitaries, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to speak today on India Japan at 70, strengthening partnership, deepening cooperation, and expanding collaboration at the invitation of India-Japan Business Forum. My congratulations to IJBF and Rajneetik Evam Neeti Anusandhan Parishad Nai Delhi for bringing the galaxy of thought leaders together to discuss this important subject. There is a clear synergy between India's and Japan's vision for the Indo-Pacific region. We see alignment between India's activist policy our Indo-Pacific vision based on the principle of Sagar and Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative and Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision. We welcome Japan's agreement to lead cooperation on trade, connectivity and maritime transport pillar of India's IPOI, which is Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. As I said, the context for India-Japan partnership Free, open, and inclusive, Indo-Pacific becomes one of the most important commitments. Our approach to this region was succinctly articulated by our Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, at Shangri-La Dialogue in 2018. India stands for an open, balanced, rule-based, and stable international trade regime in the Indo-Pacific. This is reflected in our maritime doctrine, Saga, which means ocean and it stands for security and growth for all in the region. To implement Sagar, we launched Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative in the year 2019 with ASEAN at its center. Given its central location in the Indo-Pacific region, India, that is us, have been a net provider of security, first responder, and of course, development partner. As part of our engagement in the Indo-Pacific, we are a member of the Quad. To us, Quad is a partnership for global good. Prime Minister Modi's visit to Japan in May for Quad Leaders Summit highlighted our shared commitment in areas such as climate change, COVID-19 vaccine deployment and distribution, critical and emerging technologies, space, cybersecurity, connectivity, infrastructure, development, counter-terrorism, and maritime security. India-Japan bilateral relations rooted in history and tradition, as mentioned by the chair, enjoy the status of special, strategic, and global partnership. As we celebrate the 70th anniversary of establishment of diplomatic relations this year, it is important to recall that our bilateral partnership is based on the strong foundation of shared objectives and common values such as democracy, freedom, and respect for rule of law. Growing convergence in India-Japan partnership on strategic and economic issues has immense potential to shape a peaceful, secure, and sustainable world. The vitality of the India-Japan partnership is reflected 
in the vast array of institutional mechanisms established for engagement between our two countries. Recent visits by Prime Minister of Japan, Fumio Kishida, to India on 19th and 20th of March 2022, and by our own Prime Minister to Japan on 23rd and 24th of May 2022, have provided further convergence in and momentum to our bilateral ties. During Prime Minister Kishida's visit to India, both the Prime Ministers reaffirmed their common vision for a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific and welcomed key outcomes, including the Clean Energy Partnership and an intended investment target of 5 trillion yen, approximately 42 billion US dollars uh, at the rate existing at that time, as Japanese public, private and financial investments in India over the next five years. This step is expected to intensify the bilateral trade and investment relations. From the point of view of continuity of the prominence of India-Japan partnership, it would be worth the while to note that during the recent visit of Prime Minister Modi, in addition to the current Prime Minister of Japan, Mr. Kishida, three former Prime Ministers too called on him. Former Prime Ministers Suga, Abe and Mori. All of them have been responsible for shaping the bilateral partnership over more than two decades. Both the countries are deeply engaged on climate change issues, including mitigation, technology, funding, to name a few. Similarly, clean and green energy cooperation between India and Japan continues unabated. HADR is an area where both the countries are ready not only to address their own domestic concerns, but are also ready to help others in need. Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, short SCRI, among India, Japan and Australia is aimed at securing end-to-end -end supply chains, reducing over-reliance on a single country, peaceful resolution of disputes, respect for international law, including those reflected in the UNCLOS and opposition to unilateral attempts to change the status quo through use of force or economic coercion. Defense and security cooperation has emerged as one of the most important pillars of India-Japan partnership and an important factor in ensuring peace and stability in the region. This includes bilateral exercises, participation in plurilateral exercises, training in capacity building, exchanges at subject matter experts and chiefs levels, as well as technology and equipment cooperation. The purpose of interoperability between the defense and self-defense forces of India and Japan respectively is achieved with an accelerated pace. Japan continues to play an important role in India's economic growth story. It is actively involved in various national campaigns and flagship initiatives of India. The expanse of our partnership extends into every socio-economic sector. Particularly noteworthy are infrastructure development, ICT and digitalization, energy, space, food processing, science and technology, healthcare, research and development cooperation, etc. Japan's long-standing FDI footprint in India is steadily expanding, though in last year it slipped from the fourth largest source of investment to now fifth largest source of investment. For 1,455 Japanese companies are currently invested in India, and half of them are in manufacturing sector, which is what beckons them to India. On the bilateral trade front, despite the ill effects of restrictions on movements and disruptions of supply chain, recently due to COVID-19 pandemic, we have been able to achieve a healthy trend. In the financial year 2021-22, India's exports to Japan reached 6.18 billion US dollars marking a decent approximate increase of 40% over financial year 2021. While Japanese exports to India for financial year 2021-22 reached a figure of US dollars 14.4 billion, marking a growth of 31.8% over financial year 
If we sum them up together, the total bilateral trade saw an increase of approximately 34% in last financial year and crossed US dollar 20.5 billion for the first time in the history of our bilateral relations. New industrial collaborations are in the making, even as we speak. Looking ahead, complementarity between the two countries can facilitate new, innovative, and alternate models of partnership. To make this possible, both countries need to come together to co-innovate, co-create, and co-produce for both domestic and global markets by combining their strengths and competitiveness. Japan's investment in infrastructure sector in India has been at the core of our partnership. We are engaged in technical cooperation in areas such as urban waste management, smart cities, high-speed railways, and multimodal transit-oriented development. I hope you would be aware that while Japan is the largest single country source of ODA to India, India is the largest ODA destination for Japan. Pharmaceuticals, medical device manufacturing, and research and development hold a promising future for India-Japan collaborations. India is the pharmacy of the world, and Japanese research and development can provide affordable, safe, and quality medicines and diagnostic equipment in the medical sector. India-Japan digital partnership is the cornerstone of our convergence in digital area. The digital partnership has been recently renewed to further cooperation in startups, ESDM, digital talent exchange, research and development, and security-related strategic collaboration. With rapidly increasing active internet users in India, opportunities in frontier technologies of 5G, IoT, quantum computing, blockchain, and submarine optical fiber cable system are also being scouted and indeed leveraged. We have wide ranging cooperation with Japan to promote science and technology in the areas of life sciences, material sciences, high energy physics, biotechnology, healthcare, methane hydrate, robotics, alternative source of energy, and earth sciences. ISRO and JAXA, which is the Japanese equivalent of ISRO, are also pursuing future cooperative activities in the use and exploration of outer space exclusively for peaceful purposes, disaster mitigation, and lunar missions. India and Japan are also exploring collaborations in critical minerals and new and emerging strategic technologies that are shaping the future. We are exploring cooperation in cloud computing and secured network, to name a few. We continue to deepen cooperation on people-to-people -people exchange and human resource development. There are more than 12,500 Indians in Japan who are having highly skilled visa status among a total of over 40,000 Indians living in Japan. We are focused on human resources capacity building through 20 Japanese Institute of Manufacturing and eight Japanese endowment courses aimed at skilling people in Japanese work culture and processes. In addition, after the success of technical intern training program with Japan, the signing of memorandum of cooperation on a specified skilled worker would be a promising enabler of skills matching. We are also working in increasing the number of schools and centers which can teach Japanese language and culture to the Indian youth. We are also working to overcome the challenge of other parts of Japanese culture and language barriers for migration of and mobility of Indian professionals to Japan by addressing them at national and state levels. At the end, I would like to emphasize that India-Japan partnership is shaping the contours of the regional peace, stability, and prosperity. It would not be wrong to claim that India and Japan are the key to much wanted international geostrategic stability. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Daminawa. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would like to thank <clears throat> Ambassador Verma, sir, for giving such a comprehensive outlook for India-Japan relation. 
I would now like to invite Ambassador Sri Sujan R. Chinnoy, sir, DG M MPIDA, to share his thoughts upon this issue. Introducing him, Sujan R. Chinnoy is the Director General of Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi. Since 3rd January 2019, a career diplomat of the Indian Foreign Service from 1981 to 2018, he was India's ambassador to Japan and Republic of Marshall Islands from 2015 to 2018, and earlier the ambassador to Mexico and High Commissioner to Belize. A specialist with over 25 years of experience on China, East China and uh, sorry East Asia and Asia Pacific, he served in Indian missions in Hong Kong, Beijing, and as Consul General in uh, Shanghai and Sydney. He also served as India's representative to the first committee at the United Nations in New York dealing with disarmament and international security affairs and in the Indian mission in Riyadh. At headquarters in the Ministry of External Affairs, he served as Director China as well as the head of expert group of diplomatic and military officials tasked with CBM and boundary related issues with China. On deputation for four years with the National Security Council Secretariat under the Prime Minister's office, he worked on international and external uh, internal and external national security police and anchored strategic dialogues with key interlocutors around the world. I would now like to ask his. Uh, I would now like to ask Sri Sujanath Chinoy to address the delegation, please. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, warm introduction, and let me begin by acknowledging the presence of Ambassador Vinod Kumar. Major General Rajan Locher, Ambassador uh, Sanjay Kumar Varma, Ambassador Preet Malik, Mr. Vijay Jolly, and many others uh, uh, of equal distinction. I would like to begin by congratulating the organizers for recently setting up the India Japan Business Forum to promote uh, bilateral relations with Japan. As someone who has been associated with Japan for 45 years now, beginning as uh, a university student in the 1970s and ending my career in the Indian Foreign Service as the ambassador of India to Japan, I particularly welcome and laud efforts to bring our two countries closer together. In my current assignment, uh, as also in my capacity as the honorary patron of the Indo-Japan Friendship Association of Gujarat, which is a very old and very active organization, I continue to do my bit to enhance our ties. I also thank the organizers for inviting me to, to deliver this uh, keynote address today on India-Japan ties on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the establishment of our diplomatic relations. Friends, the India-Japan Special Strategic and Global Partnership has strengthened in recent years. More fundamentally, there are no outstanding differences between us. In the past, we deferred for a brief while, as you all know, on India's nuclear tests, but that is a matter which is like water under the bridge. Today we have uh, uh, an agreement on civil nuclear cooperation. There have been suggestions recently that we have differences on the war in Ukraine, but nothing could be further from the truth. This is not something that impedes the further development of our strategic ties. Our nuanced approach uh, on the subject of Ukraine is well understood by our strategic partners, including Japan. Our cultural ties with Japan are anchored in history. We have a shared legacy of Hindu-Buddhist thought and philosophy, and we have shared values. There is growing convergence between India and Japan in regard to the Indo-Pacific and uh, the future of uh, peace, uh, stability and progress in the, in, in the Indo-Pacific will have much to do with our burgeoning ties. There is a deep mutual respect for each other's culture. One of the most outstanding enactments of the Indian epic Mahabharata is by Japan's famous Kabuki troupe, directed by renowned theater director Satoshi Miyagi and actor uh, Kikuno Suke. Uh, Mr. Kikuno Suke Onoe, who plays the role of Karna. Uh, I have seen the play and was deeply impressed uh, with what I saw. When uh, Mr. Kikuno Suke Onoe met me, uh, he presented me a framed, uh, a framed photograph of himself dressed as Karna in gold-plated armor, wielding a sword, 
standing on the banks of the Ganga. And this is uh, a truly impressive uh, picture. I've hung that picture in my study at home to remind me of these ancient links. Justice Radha Binod Pal is uh, a revered name in Japan for his lone dissenting position during the International Military Tribunal of the Far East, also known as the Tokyo Tribunal. And there are many others who have played a key role in bringing us together. Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore's admiration for Japan and interaction with Okakura Tenshin were instrumental in forging early connections between artists and intellectuals on both sides. Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose also had a long association with Japan. More recently, Kazuki Ebine, a Japanese manga artist, has published a powerfully illustrated biography on Mahatma Gandhi and his teachings. Recently, the Ramayana, a legend of Prince Ram, a famous anime film co-produced by Indians and, and Japanese, was relaunched in Japan in its latest digital version. The original version was produced by Japanese director Yogo Sako and animator Ram Mohan and music composer Vanraj Bhatia from India. Personally, I feel elated at these developments. What a wonderful way of bringing our two peoples together. Friends, in recent years, our transformational partnership has received a big boost due to the personal attention given to the relationship by Prime Minister Modi. Successive Japanese Prime Ministers have also remained deeply committed to promoting our ties. Today, Japan is involved in virtually every aspect of India's economic transformation. Japan has a significant presence in all our flagship initiatives. Our defense ties have deepened with regular dialogue and exercises between all the three services. And there is also a dialogue at the level of the Raksha Mantri and the Defense Secretary. Naval exercises in particular have a deeper significance given our growing cooperation in the Quad and our common vision of the Indo-Pacific. The Northeast of India has received considerable support from Japan in strengthening regional connectivity, infrastructure, forestry, sustainable development projects, and much else that benefits the local communities. Key highways such as the NH40, NH51, NH54, these are all supported by Japanese ODA. Japan plays a key role in India's uh, connectivity uh, with Southeast Asia. At the last annual summit held in March uh, this year between Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, both sides expressed their shared intention to realize uh, 5 trillion Japanese yen worth of public and private investments and financing from Japan to India over the next five years. That's about uh, US dollars, 42 uh, billion, in order to finance appropriate public and private projects of mutual interest. Uh, more than that, the Bilateral Industrial Competitiveness Partnership Roadmap will definitely enhance the performance of uh, Indian MSMEs. And you all know that a significant part of India's exports uh, originate in our MSMEs. Clean energy, particularly in regard to electric vehicles, is emerging as a new area of cooperation. And companies like uh, Toyota and Suzuki have already made major investments in India in this regard. The Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail Project, uh, MAHSR, which was finalized, uh, uh, I recall, during my term there as ambassador, uh, has also moved forward. It's, it's progressing well. It's an iconic example of Japanese technology as well as a symbol of strategic partnership and mutual trust. As Prime Minister Modi said, the first bullet train project will act as a catalyst for rapid economic progress and technological growth and innovation in India. Japan's presence in the uh, railways is expected to revolution revolutionize this vast sector. Just as Suzuki Motors entry into India 35 years ago fundamentally altered the Indian automotive sector and also brought in uh, the presence of uh, Japanese vendors, SMEs and supply chains. Uh, so the high speed rail project will also create new avenues for employment, economic advancement and entrepreneurial activity. And as we speak, there is good reason to laud the progress made so far, despite delays due to the pandemic and some hiccups with land acquisition in Maharashtra. Japan is a key participant in the Make in India program. Japan is India's uh, uh, major partner in, in multiple fields, 
uh, we are uh, Japan's largest ODA uh, partner, for instance. Japan is, uh, as was pointed out earlier, a very major investor in India. Uh, the cumulative figure is, is very high, $36.2 billion. And although the trade balance is uh, in Japan's favor, personally, I believe that it is Japanese FDI that is of greater significance and relevance to our economic aspirations. During Prime Minister Kishida's visit to India, uh, the two sides also renewed the US dollars 75 billion uh, currency swap agreement. And this is important uh, because it deepens financial cooperation uh, at a time when the global economy is uh, fairly volatile. Uh, during uh, my time there in Japan as ambassador, I recall that we launched a series of, uh, you know, Japan India Institutes of Manufacturing, gyms as they are called, uh, alongside Japanese endowed courses. And as was brought out, uh, by Ambassador Varma today, there are about 20 gyms that have been successfully launched by different Japanese companies around the country. Uh, quite recently, I had the privilege of uh, inaugurating the latest gym uh, in Nimrana, uh, set up by uh, the Daikin Air Conditioning Company. Uh, and thousands of Indians have already been trained in these uh, uh, Japan India Institutes of Manufacturing. Um, our cooperation in healthcare. It's a very major initiative, uh, given the fact that Japan has tremendous experience in trauma care and uh, geriatric care. And we hope through this to uh, bring about synergies between Ayushman Bharat and uh, Japan's uh, Asia Health and Wellness Initiative. Uh, there is also growing interest in Japan in regard to Ayurveda. Uh, today, there is uh, unprecedented emphasis on decoupling, uh, on reducing the overwhelming dependence that uh, the global economy has on a certain geography in East Asia. Uh, and uh, there is uh, renewed emphasis on creating alternative resilient supply chains. But within the Quad, uh, it's uh, uh, also uh, a very uh, important uh, sort of uh, step that's been taken that the India, Japan, Australia resilient supply chain initiative uh, has been launched. and. Uh, when Japan picked eight projects recently to support by way of resilient supply chains, uh, we discovered that six of those projects were uh, based out of India and two from Australia. We also need to work more with Japan, uh, which is at the cutting edge of technological advancement in artificial intelligence, big data, Internet of Things. There is great scope in our partnership to find the right points of intersection between Society 5.0 of Japan and at our end, Digital India and Startup India. Japanese companies have invested billions of dollars in Indian startups. And uh, I do believe that the Japan-India IT corridor in Hiroshima also has enormous potential in promoting B2B cooperation. Another major area of progress is in regard to the movement of professionals. In January 2021, the two sides signed a memorandum of cooperation on uh, a basic partnership framework for operation operationalization of the specified skilled worker system under which the Japanese government will accept Indian nationals who have a certain level of expertise and skill, particularly professionals with uh, an IT uh, talent. Uh, language learning is also very important. Uh, uh, without uh, focus on the Japanese language, uh, uh, we will be held back in terms of deepening our ties. Uh, the same applies to uh, the youth in Japan. They need to work more on their language skills, uh, on learning English, on being ready to travel, uh, particularly to India. The launch of collaboration between our universities uh, is uh, to be welcomed. Uh, we have now some Japanese language uh, uh, teachers training centers in India as well, and they will promote uh, precisely this kind of people-to-people uh, -to -people contact. It is in the area of disaster risk reduction that Japan, both at the level of the government as well as at the level of the Sasakawa Foundation, for instance, can play uh, an important role uh, in uh, cooperating with India. India also looks to Japan for partnerships in the development of uh, smart islands, uh, uh, fisheries, pole chain in the uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands or elsewhere along India's long coastline. Uh, this is of growing interest to both sides. A Japanese grant is also being used for a project to improve uh, power supply in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands 
for grid stabilization. I recall that during my time as ambassador in Tokyo, the uh, CEO of Sushi Zanmai chain of restaurants, uh, Mr. Kiyoshi Kimura had expressed uh, much interest in collaborating with India in the, uh, in the field of uh, uh, tuna fishing. Uh, Japan was facing depleting tuna reserves around Japan and uh, Sushi Zanmai was keen to collaborate with the fisheries department of uh, uh, Tamil Nadu to create resilient uh, tuna fish supply chains uh, for the Japanese consumer. So there are many things that we can do together uh, in defense manufacturing too. There is considerably, uh, you know, considerable cooperation. Um, and but for the fact that Japanese companies are somewhat hesitant uh, to uh, go out and uh, compete in the open market, we could have done better in my view. Uh, but still, there are many uh, important uh, opportunities uh, that uh, uh, are before us today. It augurs well that links uh, between our, prefecture, our states and prefectures in Japan are growing. An MOU between Gujarat state and uh, Hyogo prefecture uh, and uh, things like partner city agreements between Kyoto and Varanasi are some of the notable ones. As I mentioned earlier, as the honorary patron of the Indo-Japan Friendship Association of Gujarat, uh, we recently and very successfully worked with Hyogo Prefecture and the Ahmedabad Management Association to create the first ever Zen Kaizen Garden in Ahmedabad. And no less than the Prime Minister of India inaugurated it. And I welcome all of you uh, who uh, are likely to visit Ahmedabad to uh, please take some time out to visit this garden. And I'll be very happy to arrange uh, a guided tour for you. Uh, with these words, I wish the organizers uh, much success in their endeavor to deepen ties between India and Japan. Um, uh, my successor in Japan and his team are working hard to promote the bilateral relationship. And I, for one, stand ready to work with all of you and to support you in any manner possible. I wish the deliberations today great success. Thank you all very much. Thanks a lot, sir. It was indeed a very productive insights that you gave on India-Japan ties. Uh, there is an update. Um, uh, Chief Minister Mizoram uh, Mizor won't be able to join us as he is chairing a very important meeting on disaster uh, that is disaster management officials due to the uh, flood situation over there. So, uh, Shubham, you can now introduce Mr. Vijay Jolly, sir, for his opening remarks. I even welcome Lieutenant General Satish Dua, sir, who has joined us for this session as well. Namaskar, sir. Please, Shubham, go ahead. Uh, I would like to thank Ambassador Sri Chinoy, sir, for uh, providing his valuable insights on the culture camaraderie and the avenues where both the countries could cooperate, especially the part where he talked about the Ramayan. It actually brought the nostalgia, personally speaking. Uh, now, I would now like to ask Sri Vijay Jolly Ji, President DSG, to address the delegation. Introducing him, Vijay Jolly Ji is uh, President of the Delhi Study Group, along with being one of the senior members of the Bharati Janata Party. Uh, a graduate of Delhi University and a member of the Akhil Bharati Vid Vidyarthi Parishad. He first fought the New Delhi state relations from the Sagar constituency. He was appointed as the overseas chief of BJP in 2011. He was in charge of the foreign cell of Bharati Janata Party where he led and organized a senior delegation to Israel in 2010. He was also a part of the delegation that went to Beijing in 2011. He is the former in charge and Prabhari of uh, Tripura State BJP. Now, I would like to ask Vijay Jolly, sir, to please address the delegation, sir. Sir, could you please uh, unmute yourself? First of all, I wish to congratulate uh, the chairman of the BCRI, Rimanj Pandey, and the Indo-Japanese uh, Business uh, Friendship Forum, President Mr. Sadhana Deshmukh. I also 
say a Jai Hind to Ambassador Vinod Kumar, the chair today. Ambassador Sanjay Kumar Verma, the Honorable Ambassador of India to Japan. Ambassador Sujan uh, R. Chenoy. Ambassador Preet Malik, Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar, and Major General Dr. Rajan Kocharji. First of all, I would wish to pay my great compliments and accolades to the great hard work of the Japanese Ambassador in India, His Excellency Suzuki Santoshi, and vice versa, the Indian Ambassador in Japan, Sanjay Kumar Verma, for the great hard work at the grassroots level for the promotion of Indo-Japan friendship and strategic uh, relationship along with the bilateral relations progressing at a very fast pace. As a senior leader of the Bharatiya Janata Party and also as the president of uh, Delhi Study Group, an uh, NGO working in India for the past 26 years, I've visited 84 countries of the globe and Japan a couple of times. I know Japan and Japanese are pro-India centric. They are full of love and affection for the Indian friends in business, in politics, in diplomacy and any sphere of life. And I have loved promoting people to people friendship all over the globe during the past 25 years of my social and political activism from Delhi. I also take this opportunity that this year 2022 happens to be the 70th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between India and Japan. And the theme of the celebrations being building a future for our centenaries is exemplary. Since becoming Prime Minister of India in 2014, the Indian Prime Minister, Honorable Narendra Damodar Das Modi ji has visited Japan five times. First on 30th August to 3rd of September 2014, the second on 10th of November to 12th November 2016, the third from 27th October to 30th October 2018, the fourth 27th June to 29th June 2019 and the latest and the fifth one on 23rd May to 24th May 2022. India inquired with the US, Japan and Australia is committed to support a free and open Indo-Pacific is another historic step forward of the Indian diplomacy and the Indian nation. Earlier, Japan Prime Minister Fumo Kasida's India visit in March this year for the 14th India-Japan Annual Summit was another significant chapter in a close relationship. Since Japan Prime Minister pledged 42 billion US dollars worth investments in India over the next five years, Japan is the largest investor in Southeast Asia with 259 billion US dollars worth investments in infrastructure projects in Vietnam, in Malaysia, in Thailand, in Indonesia, in uh, and also in Philippines is noteworthy. And today Japan is the third largest foreign direct investment investor in Republic of India. Japan foreign direct investment is to the tune of 7.2% of India's total foreign direct investment in India. Japan sponsored major infrastructure projects in India are noteworthy. The phase one and the phase two daily mass rapid transport system, Hyderabad outer ring road project, Vishakhapatnam port extension, Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed rail project and the Mumbai Trans Harbor links are some noteworthy projects going on in India with the active assistance of the Japanese uh, uh, friendship. Japan assistance in water supply and sea bridge uh, uh, projects in India, healthcare, horticulture and biodiversity conservation projects are also significant uh, areas of 
closer cooperation between India and Japan other than the maritime security, other than the defense and also bilateral relations between the two countries. I wish to once again congratulate uh, the organizers of this today's program, which will be a milestone. And I can only assure you my whole commitment to further accelerate what our esteemed ambassadors, what our esteemed political leaders have done to bring a closer correlation between the two nations. I've been very fortunate enough during my many private uh, uh, visits as well as political visits to Japan, I interacted with the ruling Zen party, with the opposition leaders, with the media, and I found Japan to be a India-centric and friendly nation, Jai Hind and Jai Bharat. And I also thank all the esteemed ambassadors who have uh, come today to enlighten us on different aspects of Indo-Japan bilateral relation and uh, friendship. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jolliji, for such a detailed insight on India-Japan relations. Uh, moving ahead, uh, Shubham, we have Siddharth Deshmukhji. He is the President, India-Japan Business Council. So, I request you to kindly introduce him. Yes, sir. Uh, I thank Vijay Jolly, sir, for his uh, immensely uh, insightful speech. Uh, I would like, I would now like to ask uh, Siddharth Deshmukh, sir, President of IGBC, uh, to address the delegation. Before that, I would like to introduce him. Uh, Sri Siddharth Deshmukh has been the founder of multiple companies within the past two decades. He found Shimbi Labs in 2005, which have created products like Budo, Nikan, Ninjin, ETC. He also has been the founder and the president of Indo-Japan Business Council, IJBC, established in 2011, that focuses on business, trade, education, and cultural ties between India and Japan. He has been successful in establishing multiple MOUs for IGBC with various Jap Japanese organizations. He's also an active member of multiple business associations such as NASCOM, SARS Bumi, ETC. I would now like to ask Deshmukh sir to address the delegation, sir. Good morning all uh, and thank you very much to India Japan Business Forum for inviting me to such a uh, eminent personalities forum and uh, this is my third uh, time in a year sharing uh, um, dais with ambassador uh, Sanjay Kumar Verma and uh, I'm, I'm pleasure that every time any any forum comes up about India Japan uh, and I get the opportunity to speak so thank you so much and thank you to all all uh, dignitaries here all the ambassadors here uh, that I could share dais with you uh, so as we all know, uh, the year 2022 marks the 70th anniversary of establishing of diplomatic relationship between India and Japan. Uh, like everyone, Indo-Japan Business Council, IGBC, is also celebrating year-long uh, different programs uh, to celebrate this uh, momentous uh, year. Definitely, this historic year uh, for the both countries uh, ref to reflect on the past and celebrate the relationship while planning for the future. For a long time, the India-Japan alliance has been centered on economic cooperation, which has been backbone of Japan's bilateral tribe with India. However, with the Shinzo Abe, uh, Mr. Shinzo Abe's election uh, as a Japanese prime minister, this alliance has reformed its strategic trajectory. And with the recent uh, visit of Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, this strategic partnership become a very special strategic partnership. Uh, certainly because China's of expanding presence in the Indian Ocean and uh, Asian, uh, Asian as a whole area combined with the UN United States shifting interest has brought India and Japan closer together. Uh, Together, the, today the scope and cooperation includes the geopolitical and security issues, economics and technology issues, uh, commerce and people to people exchange uh, between India and Japan. The government level involvement has expanded and flourished over the last decade. We, we hear so far uh, from the different dignitaries uh, talk and uh, that how India and Japanese government are closely 
type together and how more than a normal friend how this uh, uh, partnership is growing and deepening um this connection ex uh, for expanding the cooperation in business education and culture and um, beyond uh, definitely this uh, friendship is going stronger uh, day by day but despite this fact today i would like to bring to few 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 i should say points to uh, to highlight to discuss because we are discussing the great partnership between the government to government uh, here but there are certain areas we would like to see the more things could have happened more faster things could have happened better and things could have happened uh, equally spectacular as we are progressing in this partnership such as uh, dmic we would have it it's been it, it was a us us dollar 90 billion uh, project which took off but recently it slowed down of course there are many reason but we would have like to see it you know growing faster and we hope that it will once again pick up and grow equally fast like everything else is going because this amazing project is a mega infrastructure project can bring several japanese companies to india create a lot of job opportunity cooperation innovation collaboration joint ventures together once this is completed it 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 will create a six mega uh, green field smart cities that's an amaz amazing thing it will have a freight corridor it will have a shinkansen uh, bullet train corridor and Um, many more uh, things along the smart city so we would like to see this project grow much more faster than at the current speed uh, there is a uh, one thing which we really really all as a business forum must must discuss is about uh, why it is so that we are we are having only the 1455 uh, japanese com Uh, um, companies in india in 2022 which slightly actually reduce um, um in recent recent year big of course pandemic and other things caused um, uh, these things but you know we would like to see these com number of companies increase especially on the background with the current japan and china relationship so if if we consider that we should see this progress of this uh, uh, companies coming in india to be much more faster and 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 bigger we need to look at them the cause and we need to work on on some of the facts that bring uh, these japanese companies to india faster then the pharmaceutical export to japan is far lease in 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 previous talk we saw the pharmaceutical sector in india is very strong uh literally we are, we are uh, exporting a huge worth of medicine to the uh, united states like almost uh, 5.4 billion or more and why we are failing same to do the japan of course there are multiple uh, reasons to that and we need to work on them so there is lot of scope to work together in a pharmaceutical uh, area uh, so we have the cepa a comprehensive partnership agreement which is really comprehensive which is really amazing and great but still uh, the total by uh, import and export uh, between india and japan is still still less i should say it it we have a huge scope uh, in wor working in improving this uh, uh, this uh, import and export between uh, japan this, this, so that it, this some of the things which i am highlighting here is not uh, something i should say the negative thing or shortcomings but it highlights the opportunities to work uh, highlights to you know uh, discover different areas uh, of uh, opportunities and collaboration and and, and uh, going beyond uh, traditional uh, industries and exploring the new frontiers uh, uh, and improve this uh, bilateral trade between uh, india and japan uh, so uh, in 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 
uh, as compared to if you look at the China, even if the, the relationship between China is, uh, and Japan is soaring, uh, the Japanese companies in China op operating are, I think, more than 30. 13,000 to 14,000 companies registered in China, uh, which are from the different industry, including manufacturing, while as in India, it's only 1,454. That uh, is uh, something which you need to work. And uh, the Japanese, this is amazing. The Japanese companies operating in Thailand are far more like 5,900 than as compared to in, in India. So what we can learn from uh, these geographies, What uh, what is that? we should work upon so many time i when i interact with uh, uh, with many people most of the time it, it it's talk about the language uh, and the distance affinity but i think there are more to it it's not only language because no thai like uh, thailand and japan don't doesn't speak the same language they definitely speak different language and they have to maybe either speak japanese or thai or english somewhere they have to come in between and c communicate so as we are also doing so what we can do, I think uh, as, as an industry association, Indo-Japan Business Council would like to focus on uh, this point and like to work with uh, different uh, governments, central government, different state governments and try to figure out and accept some fact and work on them, though the, there are several things happening, um, you know. They, I, I feel so excited in a recent year, recent last, I should say, Eight, eight years are like a fantastic for India-Japan um, relationship and that so many things are happening. But there is one thing I, I always wonder. So many things are happening between government. Usually it's opposite, like, you know, the things little bit gets difficult at government level, but the people to people connects are very strong. In, in Japan and India, the people to people connects are strong but business private business to business connection need to be much more stronger we would like to see the lot of privacy in private investment in india uh, japanese government is investing a lot and we uh, uh, in india and we welcome that definitely we welcome that it's a very important to improve the infrastructure improve the research capability improve the learning capacity but we would like to also see the medium and small scale industries in Japan are investing in India. Also, we are our IT sector come uh, is now at the age where we should able to invest in Japan uh, because there are so many so many uh, possibilities to work in AI, machine learning, uh, artificial um, uh, sorry um, NLP, and there are so. Uh, deep learning there are so many different uh, different areas of collaboration uh, where indian companies can also invest in uh, in uh, in japan the another significant area probably we all have to look at that to improve this situation usually what is that improves the relationship between the people to people is is usually through the young people the students the student community right so the we have to lot to do that how many indian students are visiting japan for learning and how many japanese students are also coming to india this number is very very insignificant if we compare that to uh, other western nation uh, when indian students are visiting uh, us uk canada australia these are very traditional uh, places where indian students visit and uh, um, for education we need to promote this uh, the reason for this is that japan need young people uh, from india but because of uh, language issues there are cultural issues there are things that maybe these people uh, when japan need young people that the majority of them need in a, uh, in a healthcare sector where they will be dealing with the old people in japan so they need to understand the culture language uh, when when we they want to take care of that so this will happen only when the more and more people from india go to japan and learn because once you are learning there once you are integrating with the young community over there they started living in japan as a student definitely visiting as a professional and visiting as a student is a different view you, you just suddenly you started becoming a part of the culture and and that this collaboration can go to the next very very next level uh, same 
like we have a uh, iit hyderabad in collaboration with japan but can we can we also uh, mr. Mr. Dejpong, can you yeah. please uh, sum up in 2 3 minutes please oh yeah sure uh, develop a, uh, develop a, a course in japanese for higher education in india so that many japanese student who are coming uh, who come to iit india and the learn well, the uh, you know for which the India is famous for the IT, the high uh, higher uh, high end technology, the project management. So this these are the areas where we need uh, to focus while we are going into the new area uh, of a collaboration between India and Japan. And in India Japan Business Council has been established in 2011, and we are working constantly to figure out how we can improve the people to people connection. We would love to work with all the state government and union government to work on these missions to bring people together so that uh, we can have a real ground level strong relationship between uh, between India and Japan. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Deshmukh sir, for your such a detailed insights. Now, moving ahead to the next speaker, we have Ambassador Preet Malik. So, before I ask sir to address the gathering, just a small introduction, sir. Shubham, please introduce. Uh, I would like to thank Deshmukh sir first for highlighting the positives and negatives of the relationship between the two countries. Uh, I believe we certainly will learn something from these insights and we will try to include these recommendations within the uh, next report, which would, we would try to bring in as soon as possible. Uh, I would now like to in invite Ambassador Preet Malik, sir, former ambassador to Bahrain, Cuba and Myanmar and High Commissioner to Singapore, Tanzania, Seychelles, Malaysia and Brunei to address the delegation. Prior to that, I would like to introduce him first. Preet Malik, sir, a career diplomat, had served as the ambassador to Bahrain, Cuba, Myanmar, and was the High Commissioner to Singapore, Tanzania, Seychelles, Malaysia, and Brunei. In a career spanning decades, Sri Malik has held various national and global positions. He has served as the Director, Ministry of Commerce, Government of India, and the Deputy Permanent Representative and Minister Extraordinary and Planning Potentiary to the Permanent Mission of India to the UN New York. He was the Vice President of uh, United Nations Economic and Social Council ECOSOC. From 1992 to 1995, he was, the, he was initially the Additional Secretary and then the Special Secretary Economic Relations in the Ministry of External Affairs Government of India, where he headed the relations with SARC and was involved in the definition and initiation of SAFTA or South South Asian Free Trade Area. Sri Malik has written extensively on Indian foreign policy and economic diplomacy in the Financial Express during the period 1995 to 2000. He also has contributed to the publication India Foreign Policy Agenda for the 21st century. I would now like to invite Ambassador Malik sir to address the delegation, sir, please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ambassador Verma uh, for an excellent uh, outlining of uh, the relationship between India and Japan. I would also like to thank Ambassador Vinod Kumar and Ms. General Pucha for very kindly having me present in this very important gathering. Uh, before I proceed, I just want to offer one correction. There was a mistake made by a publishing house in including me as High Commissioner of Singapore. I did not serve as High Commissioner to Singapore. I was merely a second secretary. It would have been difficult to be High Commissioner and second secretary. But uh, apart from that, everything else uh, does cover my, my, my sort of time spent. Frankly speaking, uh, my relationship or my understanding of Japan effectively commenced when I took over in the Ministry of External Affairs heading economic relations. This was in 92, in 91, when 
the Indian economy for the first time became what I would call an open economy and was part of the process of permitting the market to determine the courts and directions of the Indian economy. The relationship with Japan, frankly, became a far more important element. Uh, it was Japan that, in a sense, also helped rescue the Indian economy, which had gone through a very difficult period till July 1991. Um, one of the things that uh, I found very, very uh, interesting in the relationship at that time was the 21 points that Japan had officially communicated to India as the steps that India must take in order to become a far more attractive place for investment and doing business with. And despite all our efforts, we were unable to get all 21 areas fully integrated in such a manner that they would satisfy Japan. I finally visited Japan just a month before I retired. This was in January 1995 to establish a, a sort of what I would call a basic dialogue between the Ministry of External Affairs and METI. I met the then Minister for METI, Mr. Hashimoto, and managed to persuade him to look at India a little more, uh, sort of, I would say, with a little less rigidity. And he was kind enough at that particular moment to establish what I thought was an extremely important step of a kind of a business uh, grouping within MITI uh, so that it would sort of uh, have a direct uh, impact on the way in which Japan dealt with India in the economic and business sense. Subsequently, and this was, I was very happy that Mr. Ashmoto <coughs> visited India uh, as Minister of METI uh, and I had our then Finance Minister host him and there was a very, very significant meeting at that time between Mr. Hashimoto and the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narasimha Rao, which became even more important because soon after that, Mr. Hashimoto became Prime Minister in Japan. And it became an important element in the in the strengthening of the, and I would say, in the understanding that came to be established between the two countries. And we have seen that things have been getting more and more significantly uh, uh, cooperative uh, from 1991, 92 onwards. Now, let me uh, say that. At this particular stage, you had very important statements made by Ambassador Burma, who is the current ambassador to Tokyo. You've had a very important statement made by Ambassador Chinoy. Uh, these are people who have first-hand knowledge of how India and Japan relationships are progressing. So to, for me to intervene in those details becomes really in practice. What is important is that we should look at one factor, and that is what is happening in terms of achieving the potential that exists between the eco economies of Japan and India. Obviously, that potential is far, far away from being reached. I think uh, Mr. Deshmukh, who just intervened before I did, made an extremely important point. If the DMIC has taken so long in becoming an, an actual fact, progress has been made, but we are still not in the area of having attained what was the objective of DMIC. We've been at it since 2006, and we are now in 222. So, it's high time that we looked very closely to so what is it that is holding back progress? Is it, we, it, the important factor is that throughout we have had a problem in convincing people in Japan that A, 
the infrastructure in India is going to reach a point where it becomes extremely easy and attractive for foreign investment and foreign business dealings. This we have not been able to achieve to the, to the levels that it should have reached by now. This is an element that has stood in the way between the actual amount of uh, involvement of Japanese uh, business houses uh, in India. And the point that was just made that even Thailand has over 5,000 collaborations while India has only about 1,400 and below 1,450 uh, is a very, a very telling comment. It shows that despite every effort that has been put into place, we are still far away from reaching the kind of levels that we should have by now. Now, obviously, government to government arrangements are not the only basis. They are the ones that facilitate. They are the ones that give the kind of uh, footing for, for progress to be made. But ultimately, it has to be the private sector, the business communities on both sides that have to find the kind of resilience which would ensure that there was a greater degree of involvement. Now, let's look at it in the current sense. Obviously, we in India cannot ignore the fact that we have a basic problem with China. China is breathing down our necks from every part of its holdings in Tibet. Uh, China has shown itself as being extremely aggressive and under its present leadership has obviously created conditions which are are a problem for most countries in the region. Where, where does that leave us in terms of the relationship with Japan? We know that Japan is feeling uncomfortable and has been feeling uncomfortable where China is concerned. Uh, they also have been subjected to the kind of aggressive movements that China has been displaying. Uh, as we are witnessing in our Ladakh borders. We also know that whatever may happen, there has to be a certain solution that countries have to find to reducing the kind of levels of involvement within their economy that China has achieved. Now, obviously, the supply chain resilience is a concept which would provide the kind of benefits that we are looking for. And India, with its, um, what you, what is, sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Please, don't disturb the speaker. Sorry. Um, as I was saying that <laughs> the thought is, now slipped my mind, but anyway, let me try and gather my, 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 my thoughts again. What I was trying to mention is the fact that supply chain resilience is something that can become a very important factor in the relationship between India and Japan. Uh, it is, in a sense, already been sort of uh, given a certain foundation with the trilateral arrangement that has been worked out with yeah. India, Japan, and Australia. But it's extremely important that we understand that, that the progress that Japan, uh, Japanese companies are making, let's say, with Vietnam, we are not being able to replicate that. Why is that not happening? This is, I mean, I, I, I'm aware. Uh, look, I've been out of government since 1995, so I'm not. Uh, I'm not au fait with what is happening in the in the in the day to day and the management area. But the fact of the matter is that there are certain things that uh, anybody who's interested in knowing what is happening can understand. And is it that our business environment is not good enough to create the kind of conditions that would be more attractive for people to invest in India? This is something that we, as a country, as, in, uh, as, as, as not just the government, but the entire structures that 
deal with the economy of India have to look at. And the necessary advisories that would make the kind of conditions um, that uh, would progress this relation should, should be made. So without uh, getting into the details, and I have a very clear picture in my mind where when we talk about things like Quad, we talk, uh, talk about now the new development of IPEF, um, we talk about supply chain resilience as a, as a factor. Uh, I have very clear ideas in my mind as to how we should deal with this. But that's, this is not the time for me to launch forth on that. I will just simply make a couple of points. One is that we have to understand that technology flows into India are an extremely important factor for us. We also have to understand to, that we have to strengthen our R&D sector uh, considerably in order to ensure that we also take advantage of the skills and the talents that our own people have. So the, it should not be only confined to, to certain segments of our development. We should be, we are a huge country. We have a, a dynamism in the country, which we should tap into on the largest possible scales that we can. And in that requirement is, um, it places a tremendous amount of pressure and demand for R&D to be strengthened. So now can we not work out some kind of arrangements where our strength in R&D is also becomes an interlinking with the whole concept of supply chain resilience because we cannot afford to have a one country dependence any longer and you know it is it is a strange fact of life we are uh, with japan with whom we are much more comfortable in many ways we have reached approximately 20.5 billion dollars of two-way trade with china with whom we have problems we have crossed 100 billion and 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 more uh, and, and even after what has happened with ladakh our our trade relationship our business relationships have continued to flourish now is that in our interest is is it in the interest of india to be a sort of uh, uh, become more and more dependent on china where china can create more problems for us in the long run so it's high time that we realize that we have to work, we have to develop structures, we have to develop policies which are far more attractive for countries like Japan and the business community in Japan to look at India with a far greater amount of positivity than what we have been able to achieve so far. I'm not saying that we have not achieved a tremendous amount, we have. I know what happened in the pre-91 period and i know how much we have progressed post-1991 but the fact of the matter is that and that is the point i began with and I let me conclude on that point the potential is far higher and we are way way below achieving that potential so it is my request to our current ambassador in tokyo that to the extent that it is within his uh, capacity to do so, he should try and find it additionalities of policy inputs, which would make India even more attractive for Japanese business than it is at present. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Hi. Ambassador Preet Malik, for such a detailed uh, insights on the subject. So moving ahead, I would now like to ask Major General Dr. Rajan Kuchar, who is the co-convener of the summit, to present a formal vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Priyanshu. Uh, it's an onerous responsibility for me today on behalf of PCRI to present a vote of thanks. I have no words to express my gratitude 
all the eminent speakers and guests who were to present at this summit today in a particular uh, his excellency ambassador sanjay kumar verma ambassador uh, sujan r chinoy uh, mr vijay jolly siddharth deshpok ambassador uh, preet malik and of course uh, we missed ambassador uh, sajjan han because he has a pre uh, all of a sudden he had to move on on some engagement uh japan is known as the land of the rising sun and uh true to the name of this world japan has progressed in leaps and bounds and if we compare uh, its progress with india as rightly brought out by ambassador preet malik we have to catch up and uh, there is no uh, denying the fact that uh, research and development is a key area where we lack because only 0.6% of our gdp is uh, spent on r&d as a matter of fact the defense sector also because i am closely associated with all major initiatives in make in india and art with the bharat i have been present on various uh, uh, forums of uh, uh, of ordnance of factories and the psus we a need to uh, do a much more uh, create a better uh, business climate and this so forum is an ideal platform to highlight uh, these aspects and i'm sure uh, we will be able to give some inputs to a best of verma because he is the person who who can make it happen uh, a lot of initiatives have uh, taken place our uh, friendship with uh, japan has uh, grown over the years and especially after 2014 after uh, prime minister modi uh, he has been uh, a, a great exponent of the friendship with japan and the latest being the quad uh, the next uh, session is going to be on quad so we'll be uh, focusing on the major areas where the cooperation can be strengthened Uh, further uh, there is a north east connect also with japan and uh, uh, we have this uh, act east forum which has been established of late and it's very important that this uh, collaboration of the act east forum also takes place and a major initiative in terms of uh, healthcare uh, uh, forest resource management uh, connectivity and tourism especially in in the northeast region which has a, a previous connection with japan and uh, uh, coming to the defense uh, we have uh, progressed a lot because our navy is keep on doing a lot of exercises uh, together uh, the malabar is there the jamex is there the pasex is there dharma guardian is there and uh, with the air force also the initiatives have been uh, taken up but we would like to focus on the armed forces also uh, there is a project of the unmanned ground vehicle and robotics we would like to give a, a fillip to these uh, projects as far as the indo japanese cooperation is concerned and the uh indo japanese uh, vision 2025 uh, lay stress on urban development uh, sustainable development and the indo pacific uh, these are the strategic agendas where japan and india will have to work even harder uh with, with this i uh thank everybody the audience the pcri for a wonderful uh, initiative they have uh, taken these uh, young boys uh, uh, keep on uh, getting uh, sorted out by me from time to time but they uh, deliver in the end so uh, you know, my best wishes to them on the initiative and of course all our dignitaries uh, uh, today uh, god bless all of you have a nice day uh, jai hind thank you so much sir for your eloquent ending of the session